The first title is Fellowship. Fellowship requires communication between at least two entities. The entities do not need to be sentient for this kind of communication to occur. It occurs between a mother and infant, a master and pet, between a teacher and student, and even between plants, snowflakes, and music. However, there exists a more complex form of communication than mere fellowship, and this occurs between only sentient beings. This superior kind of communication is called karma, and this means to be called to labor. We say that to improve one's karma is to improve one's soul because we must work to communicate as sentient entities, and our doing so proves our worth to our fellow peers and the value of our contribution to history. Thus, a good soul is one that accumulates good karma. That is why good and bad units of karma comprise each element of our surrounding environment our aura, because the work of the soul is yoga, union, of the within and the without. This is accomplished when the interior of the soul and its exterior aura align. Then we say its karma is finished and the aura is cleansed. Therefore, one can only cleanse the aura of bad karma by first being called to labor from the reverie of silent fellowship. The second title is Ashlar. After the workers were called from fellowship to labor by the three kings, they began to hew stones from the quarry. What is this like? The stones began to be chiseled from the mines, but they were still uncarved, unrefined, unfinished. The rough ashlar has been compared to the uncrafted and unworked soul, while the finished ashlar, the perfect cube stone, is like the soul that transcends by finishing their karma. But the cube stone is only a symbol of the soul, while the true image of the soul's appearance is a torus, the exterior sphere of which is the aura, and whose interior spiral is kundalini ascending the chakras. So how do we perfect the ashlar, and how do we finish with karma? The workers democratically elected their finest carvers from amongst those in the quarries. These they called the builders, who had graduated from labor. The builders perfected the rough, unhewn souls quarried out of raw karma. From the twisted and the torturous serpent's union, the ripples and the rays combined. The chakras align, and the aura is cleansed. That is how the Builders Guild perfects the Ashlar souls. From among the Builders they elected their best. His name was Imhotep. Imhotep selected his son, Tahotep, as chief overseer. The remaining Builders and workers in the quarry then elected Nyarlahotep as their representative to go on their behalf before Tahotep. The names of the three kings to call the workers out of fellowship into labor were Cheops, Chephren, and Menkare. The third title is Isaiah. Isaiah is the lowest of the four worlds in Hakabalah. 
The four worlds are Yetzira, between Asaya and Bariah, and Bariah, between Yetzira and Atzaluth, the highest of the four worlds. Asaya is the world of action and all activity, both naturally occurring acts as well as the karma between sentient entities. Asaya is the combination of the mind and the physical environment by the exertion of effort by the physical tool of the body. This actually stirs up energy dystrophically, increasing entropic decay into chaos and disorder. However, what is chaos and expansion of energy in Asaya is peace and calm order by the time it reaches Atsaluth. It has been passed by then through the inversion of Bariah and Yetzira at the hands of the builders and the aura cleansed by alignment into yoga of the karma rising up the chakras. Thus, what begins as work in the world of action becomes the domicile in which we will one day universally Sabbath and finally rest from toils. The fourth title is Making. The reason we must work to cleanse our aura and to align our chakras is that they attract and spread negative karma while unaligned. This negative karma becomes manifest in our auras and thus becomes sin by narrowing our choices for actions. When we follow a tunnel reality of negative karma through perpetual sin to its logical conclusion, we find that such a tortured soul will suffer many more lifetimes in Isaiah, the lowest world. Therefore, in order to avoid such a destiny, and to instead transcend Asaya, we must use our work to make our karma good in order for our chakras to align and our aura to be cleansed. The act of making our naturally more or less negative karmic auras into perfected more or less good karmic auras is considered the great work of those called to labor. The quarriers and the builders both work and craft the ashlar to make it from bare rock into a cube stone. So the karma yoga of cleansing the aura and aligning the chakras is the act of taking the given karma and making it your own work. When we take our natural karma and make it perfect by aligning our chakras and cleansing our auras, we become more capable of transcending from the world of action, Asaya, the lowest of the four worlds. Then our work will become easier and easier until eventually, in Atsaluth, we rest from toil. The fifth title is Earth. Earth, in this case, does not refer to the planet Earth so much as to the material substance of the world of Asaya. Asaya is the manifest universe of matter alone. Although the communication between mind and energy occurs via the world of matter, it is only when one applies their natural energy toward making their karma good that rest and order in Atsaluth may be accomplished and achieved. Thus, only sentient entities called to labor and who do good work, aligning their chakras and cleansing their auras, can transcend the material reality of Asaya. According to legend, the world of matter, comprised of units of karma, 
called Quanta, arose from an event during the creation of Asaya, that is, the material universe, known as the breaking of the vessels. According to this version of the Big Bang of the universe, during the single Planck time, following the initiation of expansion by one Planck length greater than the initial singularity, all that existed were perfect geometric patterns of cycling harmonic vibrations. Following this, heat began to arise from friction as the wavelengths of these emanations began to overlap, and with that, these perfect forms became distorted and deformed into the present relative chaos and decreasing formation of patterns. Thus, according to legend, the shards of these shells form the cliffotic material world of Asaya, the smallest units of karma being the probabilistically uncertain quanta. Because the quanta of some elements of matter form solid nuclei at the center of atoms, we call this force that binds quantum nuclei together the strong nuclear force and compare it to the solid material nature of the world of Asaya and to the ancient element of Earth. The sixth title is Three. Because the material world has only six right-angled cardinal directions, we say that our universe of Asaya has only three dimensional axes. The ancients referred to these three dimensions as the three mothers, known from the Hebrew Aleph Beth as the letters Aleph, A, Mem, M, and Shin, S. These were also the three pillars of mercy, severity, and judgment, above which are suspended a pan of merit, containing water, and a pan of liability, containing fire, from a scale, a breath of air, deciding between them. The three dimensions are also symbolized in the thesis, antithesis, synthesis of dialectics, and thus by yin-yang, representing the alternation between action and passivity over time. So we see the concept of the three dimensions is a common expression used to communicate the idea of the world of work itself. However, three is also used to symbolize the way out of the materially real world of Asaya through good karma. Just as three represents the synthesis of Bina and Chakma in Kether, so too does it mean the dawning of Ayin, Ayin Sof, and Ayin Sof Or, and just as three stands for the three combined elements of salt, sulfur, and mercury to the alchemists, so too does it connote the trinity of Catholic Christianity and the blue degrees of Freemason. Whenever we see the Ashlar cube representing Earth, we must think of the three other elemental worlds and realize that the perfection of this Ashlar cube symbol of the aligned chakras and cleansed aura of a good soul is only the first step, that of making good karma in the real world to achieving transcendence from it. But know that now we have taken that step together, and it is the hardest step because it is the first. This concludes the knowledge lecture of the titles of first degree contributors.
The first title is Union. Yoga means union, and karma means labor. Just as consciousness calls us to labor, the work of perfecting our karma, so is union symbolic of the alignment of the chakras and cleansing of the aura that is the goal of karmic work. So we can refer to the work of perfecting our karma as labor, and we can refer to the goal of this labor, the perfection of our karma, as yoga or union. The work of aligning the seven chakras of the spine is one kind of yoga. The work of cleansing the aura externally surrounding each of us is another. This is why the words labor and union also have different meanings. We can refer to our inner work of aligning the chakras via an external symbol, such as the cube stone or perfect ashlar. Likewise, the term union, referring to outer effects of our inner alignments, we can symbolize as a group of workers, the chakras, all working together, aligned, toward the same goal, the cleansing of the aura. In order to achieve external yoga, we must first accomplish internal alignment of the seven chakras of the spine. In the same way, RNA unzips the double helix of DNA during cellular replication. The seven chakras are the nerve centers along the spine that deliver the commands from the brain into the gross tissues of the body. The work of aligning these seven chakras is called kundalini yoga. Kundalini represents the interior, upward spiral portion of the toroid energy field of which the aura is the exterior hypersphere. Kundalini is the inner soul or spark of life. After the inner chakras are aligned and the kundalini rises and descends throughout the nervous system unimpeded by retained stress and a desire to distraction, the aura can begin to be cleansed and the external environment itself around the entity will begin to change. This can only occur when the higher external and lesser, interior, will are aligned both within and around a being. The digital units of change in our surrounding environment are called chi, or units of karma, and they collectively comprise our aura. We say the aura of a being is cleansed when the being does the good work of perfecting themselves and does this for the right reasons. When such an alignment is achieved, we say the person has completed the great work of karma yoga. They have achieved a condition of labor union. At this point they are, if still alive, automatically members of the order of death, the union among the living and the dead who help others to achieve the great work of labor union. The original founders of this order were the Couriers Guild of Builders on the Three Great Pyramids. They studied all these types of metaphysics, and it is from them we learn the measure of the Kundalini spiral within the toroid is called phi, and that the exterior aura's measurement is, likewise, pi. The second title is Boaz. Boaz is the name given to the southern pillar on the east gateway into the inner temple of the 
first temple, called the Temple of Solomon. Any Freemason can tell you that. But what we are studying delves beyond this. What we study is perfect Atlantean masonry. Some Freemasons might try to tell you the pillar of Boaz on Solomon's temple was hollow and that it contained many treasures of the original craft masonry. Do not ask such a mason to recite Boaz's inner inventory to you, however. They will not be able to do it. These, they will tell you instead, are the so-called lost keys of masonry. But you must not bother to ask them what was inside Boaz. Instead, you must enlighten them on the true origins of the southern pillar on the eastern gateway to the temple. Instruct such a mason on the true Shemhamphorash, not the 72 names of the angels of Exodus, based on the 36 Egyptian civic calendar deacons, nor on the Goetia of Solomon based on these 72 angels being used as workers on the first temple. All that, explained to them, is only an allegory for the building of the Egyptian pyramids, followed by the rebellion of the slaves that led to the exodus to begin with. Even the pyramids of Egypt, you may explain to them, were only a repetition of a practice remembered from before the world flood that destroyed Atlantis. Thus we study Solomon to learn the fate of the workers, but we study Egypt to study the craft of the builders. By studying the Apocrypha, books excluded from but belonging in the tradition of the Bible, we can study the historical origins for the builders' practice of safe housing their tools inside the pillars of their craft. In the Book of Enoch, the Book of Jasher, the Three Steli of Shem, on the Eighth and the Ninth, and Plato's Republic, we find recounted an occult history of this secret craft. Before the Flood, before even the birth of Noah, Noah's great-grandfather, Enoch, had a prophetic dream. Enoch commissioned all the knowledge of the universe, inscribed on two pillars, to be buried with him in a tomb nine chambers deep in a secret place. He then instructed his son to give Noah a third stone tablet containing directions to this tomb to survive the flood. Abraham came to inherit Noah's stone tablet, and he took it with him from Ur into Egypt. There, in the catacombs beneath Giza, he secreted it away, the twin pillars of Enoch, and built the pyramids over them, leaving the third key buried beneath the paw of the Sphinx. Moses, also called Akhenaten, then led the enslaved builders of the pyramids out of captivity into Canaan. Solomon then built the first temple to house in its sanctum sanctorium the third keystone. Then Menelik, son of Solomon and the queen of Sheba, stole the stone from within the ark the remains of the original builders were buried on the shore of the Dead Sea, where they were later discovered by the Essenes, the exiled priests of King David, during the Roman captivity. Their writings, leading to the location of the Ark, were eventually found by the Knights Templar during the Crusades. But the Templars could not enter Egypt, and it was not until Napoleon that the pyramids could be excavated. Around this time, Neo-Jacobinism took hold in America, and the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry was created. 
from this source, we learn about the lost keys of masonry, represented by the twin pillars of the eastern entrance to the first temple. But as you can see now, the true order, the Atlantean masons, knew much, much more than anyone since the time of the flood. This order is the modern inheritor to the mysteries of Imhotep and the mastery of Atlantean masonry. All ye who seek knowledge over geometry, let them enter here, and let all you who are able to understand and who can apply, let them calculate the numbers of their own name, for they are among the numbers of the builders of the great pyramids, the first and second temples, and they are brothers in our great order. All of us stand on the shoulders of those who have gone before. In this way, we finish our good work, align our chakras to cleanse our auras, and transcend from the cares of the mundane world. The third title is Bariah. The name for the mundane world, used among those who have transcended its dull cares, who have graduated from labor and become members in our order, is Asaya. The realm above and beyond the mundane world of Asaya is that with which the order teaches union. This realm, although the lowest of God's highest heavens, is considered paradise and associated with the state of grace possessed in the Garden of Eden before the fall. This realm above the mundane world of Isaiah, the realm of Eden, is called Bariah. How do we achieve transcendental union with Bariah? Some say only through Christ can original sin be forgiven. Others believe anyone righteous in Allah, shall enjoy the fruits of paradise. Both agree such can only be achieved either in the afterlife or in an impossible utopia. Thus, those who believe in Atlantis and those who believe in Eden can both agree that so long as mankind exists in the fallen world of Isaiah, the mundane world of matter and action, of cause and effect, and the lesser will, then Bariah, the world above, remains divided from and beyond us, representing a perfect world infinitely better than the here and now. However, what does this mean to say man is fallen, or that this material reality is inferior to the realms we can presently only imagine. We say that part of man's fall separated Asaya from Bariah by the interjection of a third world called Yetzirah. According to legend, Bariah was Eden, but Yetzirah, the splendor of the emanations, shattered the vessels of Bariah into the shards of the shells the cliffotic quanta that comprise Asaya, the material universe. Thus we say that, before the fall, Bariah existed and mankind dwelt in paradise. As the fall happened, the world of Yetzirah passed through the world of Bariah and destroyed mankind's place in it. Thus, after the fall, Man dwells in Asaya, the earthly or material world. But that transcendence to Bariah is still possible. How is this to be accomplished? How does one align the chakras and cleanse the aura? It is by studying the tree of life and thus restoring the shattered shells and raising up through Yetzirah away to the arisen Bariah. Thus, when we describe Bariah, 
we mean the kingdom to come, the once and future world of perfection. However, to cleanse the aura and achieve Bariya, we must first align the chakras by studying the tree of life. Otherwise, we might achieve, but cannot attain. We can reach, but not grasp, hold, and climb. The fourth title is Formation. Yet Saira is the realm of formation now, after the fall. However, in truth, yet Saira is the realm of divine creation, and Bariah, the lesser realm, the realm of the formation of Adam in Eden. To align the chakras, we study the tree of life. The seven inferior or lesser sephirot on the tree are equivalent to the seven chakras of our present evolution. The three supernal or crown sephirot refer to the exterior aura of which the seven chakras are the interior spiral. Thus, we use the tree of life as a model for the interior chakras that we can make and form outside of ourselves. The tree of life is the way to transcend from the realm of action to the realm of Yetzirah, the divine creation. We transcend by formation, or yoga, the work of making our karma perfect. Formation refers here to studying the tree of life to align our chakras. Formation is the art of crafting one's karma. The more perfectly centered, calmly meditative, and passively flowing one's energy is, the more we say their karma is artfully crafted. The mind, distracted by disbelief, overwhelmed by doubt, and suffering from bad luck, we say such a person as this has bad karma. Karma being the combination of external chi in our aura and the kundalini spiral ascending our spines, then, like all energy fields, moves away from stasis and periodicity by nature, and, most of the time, will decay into chaos and delusions, if not worked upon. Thus, the natural condition of life is, for the majority of us even today, brutish, nasty, and short. However, through yoga union with Bariya, by aligning our chakras, by studying the tree of life, through formation of a more perfect, static, and periodically regular soul, we are graduated from labor in the world of karma in Asaya. Through formation of our souls in Yetzirah, we achieve an increasingly lasting trance of Samadhi, the waking dream. The longer we sustain this trance of calmness and clear mind, the more cleansed our aura will be, and the more we will dwell in Bariya, the lost paradise and perceive all as the divine creation. The fifth title is Water. Among the many documents of our order, we find perfect understanding of the four worlds of Kabbalah according to the following model describing the cosmological creation using the three supernal elements alone to create matter, the earth element of Asaya, the lowest world. These three supernal elements are represented by the three mother letters of the Hebrew alphabet. A is for air, M is for water, and S is for fire. 
God took fire and mixed it with air to form smoke. This we call the realm of Ayin, limitlessness, an aspect of Atsaluth, the highest world. Next, God blew the smoke with his breath and thus mixed it with moisture or spiritual water. The combination of all the smoke and water we call Ein Sof, or limitless nothingness, a lesser aspect of Atsaluth. Next, the stale, ashy water of the moist smoke began to descend, and the sweet water of God's first breath to ascend. As the watery aspects settle below, and the airy aspects above, bolts of lightning fire up, burning away the rest of the clear air. As these bolts of lightning warm the smoke, the water within it evaporates out as condensation. The light of Ein Sof Or, the lowest realm of the highest world, shining through this rain, refracts a seven-colored prismatic arc. Above, the cloud clears, and below, the ashes form mud in the water. From this mud, God made man. So we see now that Yetzirah, the emanations, or Sephirot, begin as the fiery bolts of lightning above, become the watery rainbow of air, and finally form the tree of life, connecting the realm of Bariah, water of air, to Uzziah, dry earth from fire. The tree of life, therefore, is equivalent to Yetzirah, the realm above Bariah, before the fall, and below it, afterwards. The sixth title is Seven. An initiate of our order, at this degree, should now be able to understand the esoteric meaning for the seven days of creation. These are an allegory for the seven color spectrum of Asaya, that comprise the seven lower emanations of Yetzirah, which represent, in turn, the seven chakras of our present phase in evolution. Thus, the number seven should be remembered as referring to the way to transcend Asaya by studying Yetzirah after the fall in the form of the Tree of Life and thus to align the chakras and cleanse the aura. According to the Hebrew Aleph Bet, the seven chakras, or sephirot, were equivalent to the seven visible planets of ancient stargazing. However, the dutiful student is instructed to remember the relativity between all these base seven number systems is purely a construct created by the founders of our order as a means of remembering the attributes themselves, and their base seven-factor system is due only to their convenience in this. In later levels, we will begin to address the grand cross alignment of these seven planets, and how this relates to the seven chakras and inferior emanations on the tree of life. However, for now we do not need to remember the significance of these seven planets, only understand how to align the seven chakras by studying the seven lower sephirot on the tree of life. This concludes the knowledge lecture of the titles of 2A Degree Quarriers Guild. The first title is History.
The first thing we learn from prolonging duration of meditation on the tree of life is the magic memory. The magic memory is omniscient of past events and can, by applying periodic cycles, rightly predict the future. However, because chaos increases in Asaya, we are only able to see our universe expanding from within. However, if we elevate our point of view to faster than the speed of light, then we can see that it is only because our universe is being swallowed up into a hypersphere surrounding us. Just as yet Syra is passing through a Saya, our material reality is being consumed into the energy of the emanations. A Saya is dissolving into Baraya by yet Syra passing through it. Now, another name for the world of Baraya or Eden surrounding Asaya, our material universe, is sum over histories of all particles in the universe. The sum over histories is the halo of wormholes and baby universes surrounding our universe as it is being eaten apart from within by black holes. This is the multiverse of tachyons in n dimensions, called hyperspace, and called the world of Baraya or Eden. This is, it should be recalled, only the lowest of the kingdoms of heaven. The seven lower sephirot are the seven color spectrum of light that comprises the barrier between our universal singularity our center of which is the Milky Way's galactic core. And the multiversal sum over histories of tachyonic wormholes that comprises hyperspace of N dimensions surrounding our local three dimensions in a phi over pi torus identical to the aura of our soul and the chakras of the kundalini spiral inside it. All of this is recorded in the knowledge accessible by the magic memory, because all of these things are occurring relative to one another in more or less predictably periodic cycles. Knowledge of the records accessed by the magic memory is collectively called the history of our order. The use of the magical memory attained after one has graduated from labor by studying Yetzira, the tree of life, and has begun to perceive the multiversal kingdom of paradise, Eden or Bariah, is the subject of teaching in this degree. The second title is Shibboleth. Jakin. Hebrew was esoteric hieroglyphics used among the overseer's order to keep their plans private from the couriers. Likewise, the blueprints the overseers used were draftings of shapes impossible to craft in three dimensions. Penrose triangles, impossible cubes, hypercrosses, toroids, and tesseracts. The Kabbalistic tree of life itself is a tesseract, or hypercube, viewed at antipode, or above one of the shape's figurative edges. The tesseract, or tree of life, was considered a hyperspace square and the torus, a hyperspace circle. Thus, the relationship between the torus and tesseract to the overseers was interpreted as a square-shaped circle, or 
more accurately the square of equal area to a circle by the couriers. That is how the pyramids were built, using geometry, a common language spanning across levels that could be separated by alphabets. The couriers who graduated from labor and became overseers learned to understand the strange hypershapes and metaphors used by the overseers and to read Hebrew, a now lost language, modern Hebrew being derived from Aramaic, derived from hieratic, derived from hieroglyphics. All that remains known for certain about the ancient Hebrew alphabet was that it was comprised of 22 letters, equivalent to the 12 constellations of the zodiac, the seven planets, or chakras, and the three supernal elements. With only these 22 phonetic symbols, the overseers were able to represent any number of cosmological relationships. By simply applying them to hypershapes and studying the various complex relationships, the overseers sought to restore understanding of the Atlantean calendar as part of true masonry's arts. In truth, the Atlantean calendar is only a map of the karma in the aura of ourselves, our galaxy, and our universe. The third title is Yetzira. Yetzira is the union of the exterior aura, both of the individual and that of our universe, and its interior spiral, the seven kundalini chakras of the individual, and the seven color spectrum of light. Therefore, the tree of life of Yetzira, the Sephirot emanations by which God created, is both the seven lesser Sephirot and the triad of supernal Sephirot. The seven lower Sephirot represent the seven colors and seven chakras, and the three greater Sephirot, the spiritual or higher elements the combinations of mental states occurring between interior mind and exterior matter via the surface tension of the energy that conjoins them. The seven chakras, seven colors, and seven sephirot all form a spiral measuring the interior of the torus, the shape of the soul, the exterior of which is the aura or hypersphere that is the environment surrounding the individual and the multiverse of Bariya. Thus, Yetzira, the tree of life, is an exterior square model of the interior circular shape of both the soul and the multiverse. Just as the interior soul is a torus, so the exterior tree of life is a tesseract. Just as Bariya is the exterior hypersphere surrounding Asaya, the interior sphere, so is Yetzira a measurement of the difference between them, i.e., a squared circle, or a tesseract with the same area as the difference between the inner and outer hypersphere of the universe surrounded by the multiverse. Thus, we can use the tesseract, tree of life, to measure Yetzira as the change between the interior and outer spheres as Yetzira passes through Asaya and consumes Asaya in Tubariya, the multiverse, a process known as involution. As the multiverse, 
eats the universe over time, the exterior sphere shrinking the interior sphere. The tesseract measures the change between them. Thus, we refer to the tesseract of Tao sub Tao, ultimate extension of the cube of time or perfect ashlar, and to Thoth, the god of time, as Hermes Trismegistus, the thrice greatest. So we call the tesseract tree of life an external model of time and say that it measures the change between our souls and the multiverse. The fourth title is Creation. This refers to the level of Yetzira in its proper place, supernal to Bariah, which itself was once paradise upon earth the multiverse, one with the material universe, Bariah upon the face of Asaya. However, when the interior complexification of the initial singularity of our universe appeared from within to begin expanding, at that point of critical mass, when baby universes began bubbling off of our universe through black holes. Then Bariah and Yetzirah switched places, and as the tesseract of Yetzirah and the multiversal exterior hypersphere passed through one another, this was when the universe of material reality fell, and became separate from the multiverse of paradise above. This moment, beginning in some places at the first Planck time after the Big Bang, and following the formation of the four universally elementary forces, represented the beginning of entropy and the four forces' destruction through inversion. As matter energy is pulled through a black hole, it is inverted into antimatter particles and micro-wavelength tachyons. Thus, each baby universe is only as massive as the amount of energy it consumes, and only as dense as the amount of mass. These black holes are each points on an enormous shifting web of galactic filaments, each connected by microwave tachyon superstrings in hyperspace, comprising the broken and fragmented remains of the originally pre-critical mass, perfect periodicity of all the cycling patterns of matter and energy, and the equilibrium the four elemental forces. We modeled this originally perfect periodicity as a tesseract. In truth, it was only Bariah before yet Syrah created a Sia from it. Paradise was a perfect diamond in the rough, but shattered when cut. Thus, we call the creation both the universe before critical mass and the multiverse after. The creation is the ongoing involution of the multiverse of Bariah through the universe of Asaya, measured by the Tree of Life Tesseract of Yetzirah. This occurs as matter is exchanged out of the universe into the multiverse through black holes, and energy is exchanged into the universe and out of the multiverse through the wormholes, or time tunnels, connecting them along the galactic filaments. All this is simultaneously the creation 
and destruction of both. The fifth title is Air. The force of air is associated with the Tree of Life Tesseract of Yetzirah. Just as this tesseract changes form over time, so does the wind rustle through the tree. We see the wind by observing the movement of the leaves on the tree. These leaves move and change digitally, some moving while others do not, just like the karmic cliffoth of Chi in our auras. We can therefore only see the true and invisible form of the air, true essence of Yetzira, surface of Bariah beyond, and Asaya below. By observing the nature and movement of changes to karma in our aura, and this we call meditating on the tree of life because the exterior environment of karma in our aura is a reflection of our interior alignment and flow of kundalini energy through our chakras. There is an ancient Zen cone stating that neither the wind nor the flag is what is actually moving, but only the mind. This refers to the alignment of the lesser will, the individual's mind, with the greater will, the universal mind. When the mind of our universe moves through our own mind, like the wind in the tree or the billowing flag, then we can understand how our emotions and subconscious thoughts occur as more or less regular cycles because they are merely points moving along the edges of hyperspatial shapes such as the tree of life tesseract passing through our minds as our souls involute over time the longer we maintain this state of clear-mindedness meditating on the tree of life tesseract of yetzira the more we will realize these metaphors moving through us all are archetypal to our collective consciousness and that we are all sharing in this splendorous emanating of creation together. The sixth title is Twelve. This refers to the twelve constellations of the zodiac. In Greek, which is more like ancient Hebrew than even modern Hebrew, the twelve consonants stand for the zodiac and the seven vowels for the seven planets. From very early on, at least since the Exodus, if not following then from a long, fragmented prior tradition, it is evident that the seven days of the week were implemented along with the 12-hour days and 12-hour nights. Thus, a complex correspondence exists between the seven days and 12 hours of day and night. However, to understand the overseer's point of view on the calendar, you must think like an Atlantean mason. The 12 surround the seven. The seven connect between the twelve in various alignments and arrays. The twelve are compared to the supernal three sephiroth and the planets to the lower seven sephiroth. This is not altogether accurate, however, because though the seven chakras compare with the seven planets and the seven lower sephiroth, the twelve constellations do not compare with the three spiritual or alchemical elements. 
the origins of the Twelve Signs are lost to history, but some philosophical researchers speculate they grew out of the Ten when one of them was divided into two and an additional one interpolated between the two halves. However, this would not account for the splendid math of the twelve constellations, rendering thirty-six deacons of ten degrees each, completing the three hundred and sixty degree circle. The double to form the seventy-two angels of the Exodus verse, describing the parting of the Red Sea, as well as of Solomon's Goethe. Originally, the 72 were 50 plus 22. This is one side of the arc. The other side was that 12 times 6 equals 72. Thus, by 12 of 22, 72. And thus, by 5, 360 from 72, just as by 5, 50 from 10. All of this together comprises the Atlantean Tarot, understood rightly as the tool to reading the Atlantean calendar. This concludes the knowledge lecture of the titles of 2B Degree Overseer's Order. The first title is Passage. This title refers both to the passage of time and to the passing on of a soul into the afterlife at the body's death. In ancient Egyptian metaphysics, they explained the god of the passage of time as Thoth, a magician, and the god of death they called Osiris, a king. According to the Egyptian mythology, Set, the god of the serpentine Nile, betrayed and murdered King Osiris. Thoth then raised him back to life, incarnating him as Horus, the crowned and conquering Prince of the Winds, a hawk. The serpent of Set, the Nile, was then slain by Horus, but Horus lost an eye. In the battle. The revenge of Horus upon Set is usually portrayed as a cat killing a snake with a knife. The cat refers to the Sphinx, which in turn represents the dog star, Sirius, that follows the constellation Orion, which represented Osiris. Just as is Sirius to Orion, so too is the Sphinx to the Pyramids, aligned to mirror the belt stars of the constellation Orion. The air shafts, leading from the King's Chamber in the Great Pyramid of Cheops, have also been found to have significance to astral alignments. There are also clear parallels between the Egyptian Prince Horus and the elder Norse god Odin. The Yggdrasil tree, from which Odin was hung by the feet to perceive the alphabet of runes in the reflection of the moon in a rippling pond below, bears direct reference to the Kabbalists' Tree of Life Tesseract. That is also why the Hanged Man Tarot Trump is suspended from a branch shaped like the Hebrew letter Tau or T. Tau is also the final letter in Hebrew, 
equivalent to omega in Greek. Following all these sorts of connections between archaeology and astronomy, languages and legends, is called doing Kabbalah, because this is how one meditates upon the tree of life, and thus, by doing so, aligns the chakras and cleanses the aura, which, over time, brings forth the continuously flowing magic memory, and from the application of such historical learning, to transcend in the soul this mortal world while still alive. Therefore, come to understand all things relative to the original perfect periodicity that underlies all apparently random chaos in digital reality. The signs that come then will have deeper meaning and lead one true and right. You must always remember to avoid idle folly, for death is the universal jest, and all change, only an optical illusion. The second title is T-C-H-T-W-S-S-T-K-S. The secret meaning of this anagram is Tubal Cain, Hiram Tyrion, widow's son, sendeth to King Solomon. The latter was inscribed around the capstone of the royal arch above the eastern entrance to Solomon's inner temple. The former refers to an ancient metalsmith contemporary to Enoch. Tubal Cain was a son of Cain's descent, and Enoch of the descent of crossing between Seth and Cain. Tubal Cain would have been an alchemist, for as such was the science of metallurgy known in the time of Enoch. Tubal Cain therefore, would have known the seven metals that correspond to the seven days, sephirot, colors, planets, and chakras, as well as to the seven camia, number squares of the true rows of phi over pi, the seven chief executives of the senate, and the seven bankers of the order of death. As a master of Atlantean alchemy, Tubal Cain would also have known of the three dimensions represented by the three combined and three pure spiritual elements. He would have had a full understanding of the Tree of Life because it was still visible in Eden to the west of the city of Enoch. The way back to it barred by an angel with a flaming sword. So he would have known also of Yetzira as the bond between Bariah above and Asiah below, and so rightly understood the seven as inferior to the three. But because Tubal Cain was evil, he did not understand the nature of the supernal three, and that is why, while constructing Enoch's nine-chamber-deep tomb buried in a secret place, to house also the twin stones of Orichalcum containing all universal knowledge, Tubal-Cain conspired with his brothers Javel and Jubal to slay Enoch, and to carry off the twin pillars. Because he was murdered in secret, Enoch was said to have been translated to the archangel Metatron. The evil in Tubal-Cain's heart prevented him 
from seeing the truth of the three supernal sephirot, and thus of the three worlds greater than Asaya. He could not see that Binah is Ein Sof or Chakma is Ein Sof, and that Kether is Ain. That is why Tubal Cain killed Enoch, and why Shekinah, crying for the deaths of holy men as a result of the fall of her firstborn, the Demiurge, caused the flood of all her tears. The third title is Atzaluth. Atzaluth is the highest of the four worlds of Kabbalah. Atzaluth is divided into three gradated umbrae of fluorescence, brighter below and darker beyond. This is because Ayin, the highest realm of the four worlds of Kabbalah, is equivalent to the nothingness that preceded the beginning of creation, the divine word. This nothingness is not greater than God, but it is superior all around his creation. The clear light of Ayin Sof Or, called understanding, is the superluminal radiation of micro-wavelength tachyons emanating around the singularity of our local universe, the multiverse of baby universes, and forms a nulliverse of pure energy. Beyond this is the parent black hole containing our singularity. Just as our universe's multiverse of baby universes comprises the tachyon aura of wormholes surrounding our navel singularity, so too does the very deep darkness of our parent black hole's uterine womb of nothingness surround even the outermost halo of this clear light. One has to undergo very many death-simulating rituals to achieve Ein Sof Or, but must be in a state of near-total ego transcendence, perpetually near death, to even fathom Ein Sof, the limitless nothingness. Beyond lies Ayin, the nothingness that is not, and surely unfathomable blindness. Adzaluth is the combination of Ayin, Ayin Sof, and Ayin Sof Or, as like three Sephirot on the tree of life of Yetzirah, Benah, understanding, Chakma, wisdom, and Kether, crown. The interior kundalini spiral of the seven present chakras is, as we have said, like phi, while the exterior aura of the karmic cliffoth of chi energy, like pi, can only be described to the quarriers as the circle of the zodiac. The fourth title is Conception. The highest form of Kabbalah, the most high tree of life, is the tesseract that measures the difference between the primary clear light of Ein Sof Or and the absolute nothingness of Ein. This tesseract is inside of the realm of Ein Sof, in the world of Adzaluth, but it is not the entire realm itself. 
this tesseract measuring change in the world of Adsaluth, the highest of the Kabbalists' four worlds, is named Tao Sub Tao, meaning the end of the end, Omega of Omega, and pronounced Te Hu Te He or Thoth. If we consider this highest tesseract of time as the archetypal Thoth, then we can also see that the realm whose changes or passages it measures, the realm of Ein Sof in Atzaluth, or of the difference between the clear light of our tachyon wormhole multiverse of baby universes, and the utter non-existing nothingness that is beyond this, would be like Osiris, then, for, just as Thoth, the tesseract tree of life, is like a simple square to the couriers, so too is Osiris, alike the Taurus depicted to the couriers, as the circle of the zodiac around the seven planets, or chakras. Therefore, just as the Tesseract of Thoth measures time as change between the differences of light and nothingness, so does Osiris, Lord of the Dead, embody the realm where this difference is made manifest, the shape of the Taurus of Twelve around Seven. Thus, Yatsira, the Tree of Life between Asaya and Bariah, or between Bariah and Atsaluth, is below what Ein Sof, between light and nothing, is above. For though Bariah is the long-lost pre-diluvial paradise of Eden, and the kingdom of heaven on earth, it is still only the lowest of all the kingdoms in the higher realms of heaven. There is yet much to learn. The fifth title is Fire. Because yet Syrah, the Tree of Life Tesseract, between Asaya and Bariah, after the fall, is below, identical to the Tau Sub Dao Tesseract, in Ein Sof of Atsaluth above. We say the Tree of Life is the hypercube of Thoth. Because the multiverse of tachyonic wormholes between baby universes surrounds the local universe, we call it the external hypersphere, of which the torus of our individual soul is the inner sphere, and this relationship we say is like Osiris. Just as the Tau Sub Dao Tesseract measures the change over time of the multiverse, so does the Tree of Life model the digital reality of our aura and seven present chakras. Just as the Tree of Life Tesseract is an exterior model on which to meditate to visualize the true, invisible chi of karma in our aura and thus align our chakras, we explain the Tree of Life tool to the warriors as a square, and the true work of the perfection of the soul as a circle. The square and compass thus symbolize karma, yoga, the labor union of sabbat when work is complete.
now at this presently perceived place and time all cycles appear aperiodic relative to one another however at the exact moment of creation's beginning all the cycles of all space-time were perfectly periodic relative to one another therefore we consider the relative alignments between aperiodic cycles as points or corners along the timelines or edges of temporal patterns the shapes of four space we thus compare the seemingly random alignments in space now to the conditions of constant harmony at the first moment of creation this is how to meditate on the tree of life study the alignments that occur apparently at random in nature such as the seven planets aligning between the twelve signs of the zodiac in order to understand the seemingly chaotic consciousness of the uncentered self-perspective thus aligning the seven chakras and transcending to the three higher worlds in perception that is why kundalini rises like fire and descends like water why there is a pan of merit and a pan of liability and that is why we call studying kabbalah running and returning spiritual fire is the clear light of tachyons the karma of our aura when the pure chi is free from the cliffoth that contain it and the supernal halo of the nulliverse around the multiverse around the universe the sixth title is 22 as three symbolizes the three dimensions of Asaya as seven symbolizes the interior spiral and twelve symbolizes the exterior aura so does 22 symbolize the combination in alignment involution and infinite extension of all these elements in one as seven signifies the square twelve the circle and three karma yoga or their working union as a square circle so is 22 symbolic of the great work of the grand architect complete therefore the Tao sub Tao tesseract or perfect ashlar measures the moment of creation's beginning the first Planck time of perfectly periodic cycles as at Saluth, while the tree of life tesseract of Yetzira measures the difference at C the speed of light between the outer tachyonic light of the multiverse Baraya and the inner space-time continuum of our local universe Asaya as spiritual air moves through the tree of life so is Tao sub Tao, the tesseract of Thoth, within the realm of Absolute, spiritual fire, between the light of Ion Sof Or and the nothingness of Ayin beyond. Three measures the triple spectrum of light, twilight and darkness above in Atsaluth. As much as three measures the triple dimensions of space below 
in its sire. Between these, the seven align with the twelve to measure time as the exchange of energy. Thus, in twenty-two, there are only either the three above or the three below, but the seven and twelve are between these, transforming one to the other. That is why the three are called mothers, because they are at the beginning, middle, and end of the sequence of letter vibrations. The first word, the universe. So, three equals the three dimensions of Asaya and the three supernal emanations of Ayin, Ein Sof, and Ein Sof Or, but also three equals the three worlds of Bariah, Yetzirah, and Adzaluth, between Asaya below and Ein Sof Or of Adzaluth above. So the three are supernal, but altogether there are four. The relationships between three and four are symbolized by the seven lower sephirot of Yetzirah and the twelve representing upper Bariah. Three plus four equals seven, and three times four equals twelve. As seven and twelve change places by involution over time, the three above move through the fourth below over time, and such are the chakras and the aura of the soul, an internal hologram of the multiverse of time tunnel realities. These are all depicted as the circle of Osiris, but the same measurements can all be made using the square of Thoth. This concludes the knowledge lecture of the titles of 2C Degree, Great Works Architect.